Nice to see a lot of folks. Thank you for coming. I've had the pleasure of speaking before you a number of times, both here and at the new campus on the east side. And for those who don't know me, I'm Tom Shuline, kind of an amateur historian, more of an historical investigator, really, as my friend Tim Walsh would call me. And I've been studying Iowa City history for a little over nine years and presenting on quite a few different occasions, mostly at the Senior Center, but in other places as well. So I've worked up a program for tonight that I thought we, we would look at some old photos and some newer ones and also maps and trace some of Iowa City's history. It's by no means gonna be a comprehensive thing, that would take forever to do, but anyway, we're gonna to try to show you some highlights. And as most of us know, Iowa City was created as a new city in Johnson County, which was already in existence in the Wisconsin Territory in 1837, but in 1839, Iowa City was created as a new territorial capital to be closer to the center of the territory than Burlington, Iowa was. So I will show you to begin with here, the original plat of Iowa City. Is that in focus? Um, I don't know if there's any focus option, but I wouldn't expect that to be real clear anyway. But that that's an original plat of Iowa City from 1839, we think our earliest map. And I won't say too much about that because I'll go to another rendition of it here in just a moment. But the widest street was to be Iowa Avenue at 120 feet, and it still is the widest street and certainly all of the downtown and beyond. So here's the other rendition of the 1839 map. Two churches that I've circled in red were envisioned on Church Street, but no churches were built ever on Church Street. <laughs> but that's an appropriate name, I guess, anyway, for it. College Green is circled in black down near the lower right there, and it still stands today as College Green Park. In fact, they proudly announced uh, on the sign 1839. At the top of the map where we see quarry circled in blue, we believe that's where some of the stone was taken for the exterior walls of the old capital, with other stone taken much further upstream. And Dillon's Island, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Dillon's Island, that's circled in green on the river. We can see that the area circled in purple, now known as the Pentacrest, was labeled Capital Square. And circled in, at, in brown at the upper left, is, upper left is probably an early design for the old capital. Finally, I've placed a red triangle or rectangle over what is marked National Road. It's hard to read that. And that's believed to be the site for ferry service across the river. And below the right portion of my rectangle is a promenade, which was the proposed landing for which steamboats would dock. And we did have some steamboats. The first steamboat landed in June of 1841. A number of other steamboats landed here, but variable river levels and obstructions made steady commercial steamboat service impractical. It was really tr greeted with great applause when the first one did come, or one called the Ripple, I'm not sure if it was the first, but unfortunately it just wasn't viable to carry out steady steamboat traffic. In 1850, after 11 years of existence, Iowa City had only about 1,250 people. And these slides that I'll show you with these decade dates are from the U.S. Census. I found very few photographs from early Iowa City, but I found several from the 1850s. You may be familiar with some of these because there are so few. We believe this view to be from 1854 which is a daguerreotype, an early photographic process, made by Isaac Weatherby. We have a Weatherby Park on the east side of town, and Mary Beth Sloniger has written a book about Weatherby, showing a lot of the pictures that he made, that she was privileged to access the glass plates at the Historical Society and very delicately handle them and, and make reproductions from those. 
It shows here what appears to be a wooden fence on the perimeter of the grounds of what later would be, of course, known as the Pentecrest. It didn't get that name until the naming contest was held by the Daily Iowan in 1924. We see very few trees and the old capital standing by itself. Later, a boardwalk would be constructed along the fence. It wasn't until 1863 that another building was erected on the Pentecrest. Now, this Weatherby image is also believed to be from 1854. It shows the second annual Johnson County Agricultural and Mechanical Society Fair. In short, today, the, the county fair. It was taking place in late September of 1854. If the attendance was similar to that of the first county fair held in 1853, it was three to 4,000. And this was the first location for the county fair, later moved to the area of Gateway 1, the former Warway Plaza, known to a lot of you, later still to the area just west of City High, and finally to its present location south of the airport. If we look at this, we'll see there's no east portico on the old capitol. It took a number of years to really complete. The majority of it was constructed, I believe, from 1840 to 1842. There's the roof area near the tower base of the cupola appears to be unfinished as well. And the wagon and buggy wheels look very flimsy. I noted two things about the wagon in the foreground. It looks like there are melons in the wagon. And that would be about right for that time of year, some sort of melons. Also, oxen are hooked up to pull the wagon. <clears throat> Mansheim wrote that in 1850 there were over 2,000 oxen in Johnson County. And although slower than horses, oxen could pull heavier loads and pull for a longer period of time than horses. Then we have this image, again probably from 1854, the view is of Clinton Street just across the street from the Pentecrest in what we call the 10 block south. The one that's just south of Iowa Avenue. We're looking to the northeast. We can see some covered wagons. We also see the large lettering of the business names on the storefronts. Of course, the street is dirt. The tallest building near the foreground still stands and was the recent home of McDonald Optical for a, quite a number of years. Here's a view comparing the building today with the, the 1854 image. One of, certainly one of the oldest buildings in town, Bob Hibbs speculated that it may have been the oldest downtown extant building, or maybe. This photograph was made from the corner of Clinton and Washington Streets, looking to the northwest. It was made sometime after 1866, because the building on the right of Old Capitol was built in 1866. The building to the left was built in 1863. They were known as North Hall and South Hall. South Hall was consumed in a fire in 1901, and North Hall, after being rebuilt after a fire, was demolished in the 1940s. The next map that we encounter is from 1854. We think it was produced as a promotional piece on behalf of real estate investors one of whom was local businessman H.D. Downey, whose residence is shown on the top right corner of the map. I believe he is also an attorney, and for him, the little town of Downey, Iowa was named. That's just a little bit east of us and south of West Branch. Bob Hibbs thought the original part of the house dates to 1844, and on this slide I'm comparing the house of today with the 1854 image. The house is at the far north end of Johnson Street on the east side, north of Brown Street, and was owned by Bruce and Florence Glasgow, Glasgow for 40 years or so. Some of you may remember the Glasgow's with Bruce being a developer and Florence a realtor and their son Dan, who had Dan shortstop across from Regina. 
Three railroad lines are shown on the map, and the rail line at the north end of town, shown by the, my black arrow, is labeled the Iowa Lions Central Railroad, and it was never laid. However, the roadbed was built over much of the line, including the portion just east of this map. And I think you can, a friend of mine identifies some of the topography with me one time, but I'm not sure I could really specify, but it ran not too far from the old, now old, Press Citizen building on North Dodge and through the area of the Catholic Cemetery. But anyway, uh, before the railroad could be completed, it went bankrupt, leaving many workers unpaid, and the railroad line never came into existence. It, it acquired the moniker the Calico Railway. The rail line marked by the blue arrow at the bottom also never came to be. It's marked proposed railroad from Dubuque to Keokuk. And it, it runs here and goes up along the river here and up this way right here. And I don't know that any, any uh, railroad bed was even put in. I don't have any other history on that. <laughs> But the curved east-west line marked by the red arrow was completed. It was the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad. That was the name of our first railroad that came to Iowa City. The kind of fable, perhaps, is that it had arrived just in the nick of time before midnight on the 31st of December of 1855. But certainly it was here by the 1st of January in 1856. Recognition plaques can be found on each side of the Summit Street Bridge, if you've ever looked across on the bridge there, that tell a short story about the railroad. And the line later became the Rock Island Line, known to many of you as such, and carried passengers until I believe it was 1970. If we zoom in on the top part of the map, west of the Iowa River, we can see that someone proposed a layout of streets with names including Atlantic, Pacific, Sacramento, San Francisco, and Nevada. Hard, hard to read them there. And of course, and why were these names chosen? I don't know. Of course, they never came to be, but later the Manville Heights edition came about with different street names in that location. And circled in black is the word brewery, and it, you can't make that out really, but that was the Angler City Brewery or City Brewery, and that came about in 1853, so it was certainly here when this map was made. I'll have more to say about the breweries in a little bit. And on the west side of the river, in the center portion of the map, we see College, Burlington, and Court Streets as extensions of their east side counterparts. And these, of course, never came to be designated as such. We also see at least one more island on the Iowa River in addition to Dillon's Island. This one is marked Bath Island, when you can see a better copy and, and read it. It's, it's called Bath Island. Again, no, no history on, on Bath Island. Further south on the west side of the river, three streets are depicted that did come to be. They are Myrtle, Olive, and Orchard Streets. By 1860, the population of Iowa City had grown to 5,214, which was more than a 300% increase from 1850. I believe the arrival of the air railroad must have had a profound effect on this increase. And here's an image of the old capital, what we'll, we now call the old capital, made just after Lincoln's assassination in April of 1865, <clears throat> with a crowd that gathered for memorial service. And we can see now that the East Portico had been added. There was only a modest increase in population in the decade of the 1860s. The next map I have is from 1870, and it shows the increase in area compared to the original Iowa City that I outlined in red. So by 1870, the area has more than doubled. Iowa City was in the midst of a manufacturing boom that would continue into the late 1890s. And I'll show you evidence of that with another map shortly. 
I've circled names of property owners in red that remain associated with Iowa City today. Can't read them here, really, or maybe a little bit. But names like Kirkwood, Sharpless, Hutchinson, that we see in Mandel Heights, Engler, Linder, and Lucas. And the property circled in green down here was that of a J. Stover, a name that may have linked to the later Russell Stover Candy Company. The Stover property would become the Iowa City Airport site. And here, tiny Coralville, I've circled in blue. Significantly, there was a dam there with three associated mills marked as paper, floor, and wooden, woolen. Here's another map from 1870. The colored sections represent the four wards that the city was divided into. Is that? Somehow the focus doesn't seem right on his pictures, but I don't know. Is there any adjustment that can be made that you ladies know of? I don't know. Probably not. I, I haven't encountered that before, so I, I really don't know. But it's not too important. It'd be nice to have it a little sharper for you, though. But on this map, we see that the, the colored sections represent the four political wards that the city was divided into. And each ward had an elementary school. And all of those, we believe, were built in the late 1850s, maybe 1857. And they were all replaced, not until 1917 and 1918, with, actually 1918, with Mann, Saban, and Longfellow. And prior to that, in 1917, the Kellogg School, which many of you or most haven't heard of. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment, too. This is the Cauldron Opera House, and so I'm trying to take things kind of chronologically, and I'll, I'll jump a little bit ahead when I get to something to show what it became later, but then I'll tell you when we get back on, on the, the year that we're talking about. So we're in the 1870s, and this is the Cauldron Opera House at the southeast corner of Clinton and College Streets, built in 1877. It staged live productions, including vaudeville acts, and also showed movies, but it closed in 1912 due to competition from other Iowa City theaters, probably mainly the Englert. After extensive exterior and interior alterations, we think the core of the original building still stands, now housing, amongst other things, a Wells Fargo bank. In the 19, or 1870s, Iowa City grew a little more percentage-wise than it had in the 1860s. These are excerpts from Sanborn fire insurance maps that show the presence of three breweries in Iowa City in 1883. Sanborn was a New York company that created maps of urban areas that allowed fire insurance companies to assess their liability. The maps contained a great amount of detail, for example, color coding to indicate if the building was frame, brick, stone, iron, etc. Number of stories, stables were marked with X's, widths of buildings, windows, shutters, types of roofs, if night watchmen were present, on and on. The three breweries were all clustered together along Market Street within a block of each other and a series of tunnels and caves were created with at least one cave still accessible today. You may have read recent newspaper articles in the last 10, 15 years regarding the, the beer caves. And a man who's very interested in it is the current owner of John's Grocery, who is grandson, I want to say Doug Elberhasky. And he gave me quite a, a nice presentation on PowerPoint slides that he gives in conjunction with the beer tasting thing that he says takes about two hours and uh, costs $25, he said. But anyway, very, he's very interesting and had a lot of interesting things to say the other day when I stopped by there. So, the Engler City Brewery, I think it went by Engler Brewery or City Brewery, was founded in 1853 as the first of the three breweries. And England stopped brewing beer in, I believe, 1883, from what I've read, and turned to the ice and firewood business that he had been concurrently working with, with the brewery business. And that, of course, is the Englert family. This was Louis Englert, who, 
founded that, and he later became what was called one of the Greenbeards in the Civil War for older individuals who wanted to enlist and do some good in the war. They were often lookouts or guards, but they uh, did see a little bit of action, I think, in some cases. The Union Brewery at today's site called Brewery Square that you're familiar with was founded, I think, in 1857 as the Hudson Geiger Brewery. And it went through name changes and ownerships and it was brewed, it brewed beer until it was forced out of business in 1916 with the advent of prohibition in Iowa. That's right, Iowa had prohibition four years earlier than national prohibition came about in 1920 with the passage of the 18th Amendment. In March of 1918, in the former brewery building, the Mississippi Valley Rubber Company began the manufacture of automobile inner tubes and casings. And then five years later, in 1923, the rubber company sold the building to Economy Advertising, which remained there for over 60 years. Finally, in the 1980s, the building was remodeled into today's Brewery Square, as seen there in the lower right. And the Dostal Brothers Brewery was founded as the Great Western Brewery in 1857. So these were all real close together in their date of origins. And it became one of the largest breweries in Iowa. It was on the site of today's Bluebird Restaurant. It burned down in 1904, but was rebuilt. And after Iowa had prohibition in 1916, it became a creamery and ice company. Now this is a photo assemblage of the two that Doug Alberhasky put together. I didn't know that. I had captured it some time before, but he told me that in the course of our discussion. He thought that this was a 1909 picture of a parade honoring Spanish-American War veterans from 1898. Another source told me that it was a 1917 picture. So it's, it's uncertain. But in any event, you can get an idea of the size of the brewery that was in the, probably went from the Bluebird all the way to, to or past where George's Buffet is. You know the place that doesn't have a buffet? <laughs> but George's Buffet was built in 1939 as a new building, so it was started by George Kanak, or I guess they pronounce it Kanyak, in the the Czech language. Now turning to, to the 1888 Sanborn map, its index that I have surrounded by a red rectangle tells us that in Iowa City there were three breweries that we just talked about, four flour mills, a glucose company, maybe kind of a corn sweetener operation, a linseed oil works, an alcohol company, a glass company, a packing house, and the Iowa City Gas Lake Company, which manufactured a flammable gas called coal gas. Is anybody familiar with coal gas? Coal gas was manufactured gas. And I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about that here. How was gas manufactured? To, to put it in real basic terms, coal was heated in an oxygen-deprived environment, perhaps up to 1,800 or 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, upon which a flammable gas was evolved and collected in this large tank. And then it's like a bladder and it would raise up as more gas went into it. And I think I read where the gas was principally a mixture of methane, hydrogen, and maybe carbon monoxide. But it was used and piped to various areas, including street lamps in Iowa City, all the way till 1937 when we got natural gas. And the plant, you, I think some of you will remember, was on the area of Burlington Street on the south side, east of the creek, so just east of Van Buren. Kathy, do you remember much of that there? It wasn't torn down until the, the last part of it, I think, was demolished in 1983. And that's, I think, a picture of that being taking place there. And soon after, the apartment building appeared. 
and there was talk about a lot of nasty residue chemicals in the ground and so forth. And anyway, there were coal, coal gas plants were prevalent in Iowa and other parts of, of the state as well. This is, uh, if you would stand in the parking lot of the Robert A. Lee Rec Center facing Burlington Street, this is, this is Van Buren. I think that's Van Buren, isn't it? And, and uh, the plant was just right over there to the east. Now we're returning to the 1888 Sandmore map. The fine print over Dillon's Island says submerged April 8, 1881. There was a major flood in 1881, and Dillon's Island does not appear on subsequent Iowa City maps. Now, was it literally washed away? Or, I seems to me I read, but I couldn't find it, that they may have filled in here. And this is about where the Iowa Memorial Union, the westernmost building is. So I'm not sure just what happened to Dillon's Island. Maybe somebody will have a comment about that afterwards. Now, on this 1889 map, I've traced the course of yet another railroad line in red. It reached Iowa City in 1877 as a branch of the Burlington Cedar Rapids and Northern Railroad, known locally as, anybody remember? The Plug. It was called The Plug. It came into Iowa City from the east between Ralston Creek and where Friendship Avenue would later be established, and it remained in use till about 1930. The passenger depot for the plug was at the site of today's parking lot for the Robert E. Lee Recreation Center on Gilbert Street. And from there, the line continued south to hills and beyond. And this slide I made up compares the view from the bridge over College Street in about 1900 to today. And this was the passenger depot and the freight depot on the other side. So the, the rec center would be right about there. There are reminders of the plug line and evidence in Iowa City today. If, if we would drive north on 7th Avenue from Court Street and then turn west on the College Street, shortly after that, take a look to the, to the right and it reveals this one-time right-of-way for the railroad. It seems to be like a grass alleyway. That's where, and this is evidence perhaps of, of where the track was also. There are other evidences also in town. The building that houses what's currently Perez Family Tacos this is on the northwest corner of Iowa Avenue and North Dodge Street. It tells the story. The southeast corner of the building is angled off for a reason. That would be right along in here. I have a better view of it here. Anybody know why? This, this is, uh, there's the angled portion of the building right there. Remember the line came through in the 1870s. This building was built in 1930 by Doc Mile, he went by the name of Doc. His parents were both doctors and he acquired the moniker of Doc. This was built as, as a service station in 1930. Later, Doc and his wife added what they called the two mile in. He being one mile and his wife one mile. It was spelled M-I-G-H-E-L-L, -L, but pronounced mile. And to take you down memory lane, this is a list of all the different restaurants. A lot of you remember these, uh, especially Made Right. The ones that didn't last very long were Speakeasy, Doug's Diner, anybody remember Doug's Diner? The Made Right had two different appearances there. Lou Henry's lasted quite a while. And, and these all lasted a very short period of time. Billy's High had, oh, what, a couple of years, maybe? Two or three years. So, but just look how close the, the railroad car came to the building.
Now we'll look at an 1889 map here. This is a great map. The original city is shown in pink, block by block, with numbers of the blocks that they ascribed originally. And many additions are labeled, once to the north, south, and east. If we could read them, we'd see the names of a lot of these. And up here in the upper right is one that I want to talk about in a moment a little bit more. It's, it was called the St. Matthias Edition, and it's in the area of today's Hilltop Tavern and Restaurant. Iowa City actually had a small decrease in population during the 1880s. It seems to me a little bit incongruous since Iowa City manufacturing was, was booming and so forth, but that's what the census figure showed. Now, prior to 1895, some Iowa City streets had been covered with macadam, which is a form of crushed rock. But there would be problems with the macadam washing out sometimes. But it was certainly better than, than dirt. But when the rains came on the dirt streets, they just turned into quagmires, of course, and wagon wheels and buggies got bogged down, and the subsequent bad ruts were left for, for later difficulty. The first real improvement came in 1895 when the first street was bricked, and it was the portion of Clinton Street between Washington and Jefferson. Here we're looking at the portion that would be in the 10 block south across from the Pentecrest. It's revealing. It shows a sand and gravel base being applied before the bricks were laid. And note the steamroller in the view at the right. And I've also labeled the limestone curb that was set in place. That's just above the, the yellow here by, by the printing here. Many streets still have the original limestone curbs. And in the upper center, you can see the large amount of bricks that were stacked up there ready to be laid. Also quite a few trees, no doubt elms, or a good, good many were elm trees. Finally, on the utility pole, it looks like there might be a mailbox. Is that in the view here? Right down there, yeah, yeah. Somehow the, the slides just don't look real sharp. This is a map of the newly proposed town, or suburb, or whatever you want to call it, of East Iowa City in 1898. Will, Willard Maine bought the farmland and laid out a plan for what he called East Iowa City. He built a factory there in 1899 and proposed a street railway to make travel to and fro Iowa City convenient. That's shown by this dashed line here, what he proposed. Now where it says Puritan Factory Reserve is where he built the factory and, and had that, that name. Now before I go on, I wanna see if I've covered everything here. Anyway, of the factory that I'll show you in a moment, Maine stated, quote, we have erected at East Iowa City the largest jewelry factory in the United States, if not in the world. That's quite a statement. Here it is. And so picture this in, in Chattuck Green, today's park of Chattuck Green, where Carl Chattuck had his dirt and gravel business. Maine tried to sell his lots in East Iowa City with only modest success in spite of an aggressive newspaper advertising campaign that he carried out over many years. He left the jewelry business, left Iowa City and the factory reverted to other uses, ending up as a storage facility for seed corn. And in 1937, in a tremendous fire, it burned to the ground. And it became later as I said, the dirt and gravel and Chad Green. Also in 1899, the O.S. Kelly Company built a farm implement and small engine manufactory on Sheridan Avenue, and the Bernard Fry Extract and Perfume Company was established on Gilbert Street downtown. Here is an 1899 Iowa City Sanborn fire map of the Pentecrest. Thirteen buildings are shown on the Pentecrest. Over the years, I found at least 19 buildings have stood on the Pentecrest, and it was not until 1975 that just the five of today were all that were left. 
When the Pentecost name was first used, there were still these seven buildings on the site. And of course, the reference was to the symmetrical array of the four buildings around the old capital. This was probably taken in the early 1940s, I'm going to say. It was before 1947 in any event, because that's when North Hall was demolished. That's right here. 1947, I think, is when they demolished it, or 1946, right around in there. Well, that's Old Dental, what we called Old Dental in later years, and that was demolished in 1975. And it became the credit union amongst it. It was actually the first site, I believe, of the elementary program of the university schools. We think of U High, it was also U Elementary. And that, I think, is where they got their start. Or, or the very start might have been Schaefer Hall, at least for the high school portion of it, and then it moved on to later the other North Hall. You know, this is not to be confused, of course, with today's North Hall. By 1900, Iowa City had grown to almost 8,000, with a modest increase during the 1890s. Here's a 1900 Iowa City map. I've outlined the original city in black, and you can see that Iowa City has now tripled in area. Instead of four words, there are now five, and we can see East Iowa City on the lower right is a separate community. It was, it was not joined. This was the future Rundle edition in here, the Rundle farm. Left of the river, not much development. There, there are, of course, a few old buildings from the 1800s over there, but not much going on at all. Now I hit the wrong button here. We've got to figure out what's going to happen here. Let's see. I'll enter that. Let's go back. Okay, let's go to that, see if I had anything else on this slide. Okay, now this is another map that Bob Hibbs did a postcard, remember when he was doing the postcards in the newspaper for a while, and it's a 1900 map. It shows the University of Iowa represented by the university campus, and that's about the, where the entirety of the university was. And at that time in Rome, it was about 1,350. The area name that says Park right here, along the river, became the university football and baseball fields until Kinnick Stadium opened in 1929. The existence of East Iowa City is clearly shown as a separate town. And that explains why First Avenue today is farther from Central Iowa City than Seventh Avenue. Normally, numbering is done from the inner core of the city outward, but it was a, its own thing, and that's what Willard Main decided to call his streets. The looping railroad line belongs again to the plug, the Burlington, Cedar Rapids, and Northern that went through there. <coughs> On this 1900 map, we see the fairgrounds that's shown here, that in the area that's just west of today's City High, and it moves south of the airport in the 1920s, leaving the area to become the Morningside edition in 1924. This is a 1906-7 university campus map, and below my red arrow we see the Iowa football and baseball fields on the river, right against the river. The stands came out along almost overhanging the, the river bank. They're on the river there. <coughs> Let's see, I wanted to show you, let's go ahead to this. Okay, this is, we're shifting now back to downtown Iowa City in the early 1900s. On the left we see this thing that says Dreamland, five cents. It was one of the earliest downtown Iowa City movie theaters and it shows the admission price of five cents. The right, the image here is what we see today in the buildings. These were some of the few that survived urban renewal on South Dubuque Street in the, 18th, or in the 1970s. 
Dreamland was one of the Nickelodeons in Iowa City, and the Nickelodeon name derived from the five cent admission charge in Odeon, which was the ancient name for a Grecian theater. Dreamland was established by Fred Racine. Anybody remember Racine cigar stores? He had four different stores operating at the same time in Iowa City. The Nickelodeons were established throughout the U.S. and flourished from, oh, 1905 to 1915 or so, often as crude theaters, poorly ventilated, with hard wooden seats. But they served their purpose to introduce people to motion pictures, but they became outmoded as longer films became common and larger, better appointed motion picture theaters were built. This is a 1909 through 1910 campus map. Shows the route of the Crandick, the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railroad that came down across the river, right along the, the backside here of the stadium, and it made its loop around what is today Old Capitol Square or the Old Capitol Mall. Mall. That's what it was going around right there. Oh, and also on this map, nine buildings are now shown on the Pentecrest. We have varying numbers of, of buildings that show up as, as we go through here. Here's the population figure for 1910. The decade of the 1900s had the largest percentage increase since that of the 1850s. We think this photo is from 1921. I'm comparing it to an image of today. The Unitarian Church was built in 1908. It's, it's very clearly what, what it is. What's a bit of a mystery to me here is the large smokestack. Doug Alberhaske told me he thought there was a foundry where the Centennial, the, the Iowa State Historical Society building is. Couldn't find any reference to that in searching newspapers. There was a university laundry there. I can't imagine they would what they need a big stack like that, I don't know. But that's a little bit of a mystery that I'd like to find out more about. Now this map appeared in a newspaper on March 16th, 1910. I've added these red lines. The voters of Johnson County went to the polls to decide if the boundaries of the city should be increased. If the measure passed, the city would double in size. So before the voting occurred, the size of Iowa City was, I'm, was as I'm showing it here in red. The measure did pass, and the, the limits of the city were expanded to the blue lines that I've added. And they took in an all by one act, East Iowa City, the Rundle Edition, City Park, the Manville, Chautauqua Heights, Suburban Heights, and Varsity Heights editions, and a lot of undeveloped land. Here is a view of Iowa City in 1910, after the expansion with the city limits marked by red lines. I'm gonna zoom in on the portion that I've shown by the green oval here. This is at the top of the river where it makes a bend. Anybody heard of Minnehaha? And the golf grounds. It was built by P.J. Regan, the Minnehaha, is kind of a resort and hotel restaurant. And we can see that Taft Speedway had already it's received its name. The name came about because William Howard Taft, well, not yet president, came to Iowa City in 1907 when he was Secretary of War. And he was in attendance at the commencement exercises at the University of Iowa. According to one story, he was escorted down the road to the Minnehaha area at the fast speed of 40 miles per hour. And we see City Park across the river, just to the west of Minnehaha, the golf grounds right here. A nine hole golf course, the first in Iowa City, opened here in the year 1900 and became part of Iowa City Country Club in 1902. And then in 1947, it was sold to the Iowa City Elks Lodge. So most of the contours of today's Elks golf course are as they were created in 1900 without the benefit of modern machinery. Probably horses dragging scoops, a very laborious process of, of working the ground. In downtown Iowa City, the pastime 
was the first building constructed specifically for the showing of movies. It opened as the Pastime Picture Palace in January 1912, just a little ahead of Angler. It was on East College Street on the site of today's Graduate Hotel. The Pastime was renamed the Capitol, you might remember the Capitol, in 1947 that ran until 1960. Other downtown theaters that have come and gone are the Engler, the Garden Theater, Varsity, the Astro, the Strand, and the Iowa Theater, with only the Engler name remaining but not screening movies anymore. This is a 1912 photograph. No, this is not right. I think this should be 1922. This is when the professional paid firefighting force was established in Iowa City. That was not 1912. I think 1922 is about right. But that ended the era of firefighting entirely by volunteers in Iowa City. Now let's move ahead to a 1917 map, and we see the St. Matthias edition that I mentioned earlier up here in red. Father Matthias Loris was the bishop of the Dubuque Diocese, and he acquired this property on behalf of the Catholic Church. And he's the name that's ascribed to Loris College in Dubuque. Zooming in, we can see St. John, St. Matthias's, St. Clement's, and St. Peter's alleys. Up until recently, the driveway leading from Summit Street into the parking lot of the Hilltop Tavern was still marked as St. Peter's Alley. I think they've taken the sign down. Today, St. Clement Street and St. Matthias Alley remain. On the south portion of the map, I've circled Canning Factory in red. That was the O.S. Kelly factory that started in 1899. You'll remember advanced drainage systems, and that's how it ended its life in Iowa City. Circled in green is the Longfellow Elementary School, and just north of it, the land where Nicholas Oakes took clay from, the hollowed out portion that later would become Schrader Field, where Iowa City played football. And the area in blue here on the west side of the river shows that development was beginning on the west side of the river. The many red dots I put in represent undeveloped areas of Iowa City, at least a lot of them. There was a 12% growth in Iowa City during the 19-teens, bringing the population up to a little over 11,000. Here's a campus map from 1920-21, where I have outlined to show that there were four different rail lines in service during that year, and all four of them carried passengers, as well as freight. The only one that didn't really carry freight was the streetcar, I would say. The black line is the Chicago Rock Island Pacific Railroad that started as the Mississippi and Missouri. The yellow line is the route of the Burlington, Cedar Rapids, and Northern. The blue line traces the Crandick, which operated from 1904 to 1953. And the red lines show the five routes of the Iowa City streetcar, which first ran in 1910. This is a view from Bob Hibbs' postcard and it shows what Bob described as the intense hard labor applied to install the streetcar tracks on North Dubuque Street. And here's the Rundle streetcar in operation, or Rundell, perhaps. And in this view of Rundle Street today, it shows that it was built extra wide to accommodate automobile traffic on either side of, of the tracks, and perhaps horse, horses and so forth. Now returning to the 1920s, here's a great aerial photo showing Iowa Field and the baseball field. It was taken sometime after 1924. No university buildings on the west side. There's the football stadium and the baseball field right here. This is a comparison with today, with the parking lot, the English Philosophy Building, and the library would be just to the east there. This shows the entrance to Iowa Field in maybe 1921, not sure on the date, and this is what it looks like today. This would be at about the north entrance of the main university library, looking underneath here.
This is a circa 1911 to 1915 image. Shows that a good many houses and a grocery store stood on the land of today's Hubbard Park. Can you picture where Hubbard Park is? It's down right off of Madison Street, just to the west of Madison Street between Iowa Avenue and Jefferson. Had a lot of houses on it until the early 1920s. The, the, it received a lot of floods, major floods. Real estate values there were not very high. And at some point, it then became women's athletic field in the 20s, and, and also it was later called Union Field, probably from the IMU being nearby, I suppose. This view compares to Hubbard Park of today with what it looked like in the 19, maybe 15 era with all those houses. Pardon? Yeah, this is the Ranella grocery store right here. There's a little story to tell. I don't know that I've got it in here. I don't think so. But Ranella, Mr. Ranella moved to the airliner building and opened a grocery there where the airliner is on Clinton Street. Lived above, as they often did. And then later he changed it into a restaurant called the airliner and i think the name was described from a place near midway airport in chicago that they liked that they ate at called the airliner that's the story that i read at least about that and that the airliner was i think in the 1940s when that was formed this is a really neat picture i wish we had more like this this is very telling we're looking down washington street at the dubuque street intersection with the Jefferson Hotel, the most prominent thing. The Jefferson Hotel received two extra stories in 1928. So we think this is probably a 1925 image. The streetcar on the lower left here would not remain in operation very long because here we've got buses that have been introduced in around the mid 20s, maybe a little earlier than the mid 20s. And with an infinite number of routes that buses could take on, and, and a large number of buses, streetcar just didn't have any use anymore. So it went out in 1931. It only lasted from 1910 to 1931, that's 20 years. And streetcars were in such places as Des Moines and probably the 1890s, maybe even late 1880s. So some areas had a lot longer run of streetcars than Iowa City. <coughs> The part of the, of the emphasis for the streetcar in Iowa City was the development of the Rundle edition where they promised a streetcar to come to there as part of the incentive to sell lots. Oh, I wanted to point out some other things here too. Notice the traffic officer here. We see a later picture of this intersection with a traffic light that's just one light right in the middle. And so it had four facing lights to, to direct traffic. And also Racine's, here's one of Racine's store operations that was out of there and, and in the lobby of the hotel. He had three other locations. And also this kind of elegant street lamp that's right here. So we here you have a mixture of mostly automobiles, streetcar, and buses. <coughs> 